54th class has to do with the politics of conflict. And just to let you all know right out of the gates, this is a toughie. More of a college vibe than a high school vibe, in my opinion. But I figure that's why you sign up for AP. Get yourself ready for the next level. And if you were absent, the assignment is on Google Classroom, Class 54. And it's called Class 54 Assignment. I know that's not very creative, but it is truth in advertising. So we started off with a talk on politics in general, or politics is more of a concept. And we looked at Foucault's idea of war by another means. We looked at the who, the what, the when and how that goes into politics, okay? Now his sentiment certainly applies to this era. Political movements became active as perceived ills of capitalism became, became galvanizing forces in politics. I know that's real eggheady, but I hope you understand that, that politics is war by another means, okay? And there's a lot of conflict during this time. So I'm going to be brief in this video um, just because of the volume of information, but if you don't care for that, feel free to use the PowerPoint or pages 529 to 546 if you prefer. So I'm going to zip through these just to give you a little lay of the land here. And we started off with farmers, okay? 1870s, 1880s, American farmers were living very difficult lives. Now, urban America saw itself as, you know, modern and up-to-date, but the rural areas are backward, hazy, that nickname hazy came out during this time. But farmers, if you think about it, might be the most important of all the occupations. We all need to eat, okay? I don't care if you're a beggar or the richest person in America, you have to eat. So their challenges range from the physicality of the work, the market fluctuations, international competition, and lack of political representation. So we start seeing farmers galvanized, demanding more rights. And we see things like the Farmers Alliance and other groups, okay? And we look at the Farmers Alliance, and there was a broad mass movement in the rural South and West that encompassed several organizations demanding political and economic reforms. It was the foundation of what was going to become known as the populist Party. And here's an example, the Grange. It was a national organization of farmers um, after the Civil War to promote the rights and dignity of farmers with their slogan, I feed you all, which is a pretty good slogan if you ask me. Okay, so we see farmers um, getting together and demanding a better situation for themselves. Okay, and going to this populism idea again, it's a word we still hear that populism is a political approach that strives to appeal to ordinary people that feel that their concerns are disregarded by the established. You're looking for regular everyday people that want their voices heard more. And it became a formal political party in July of 1892 in Nebraska. And their candidate, James Weaver, received a million votes. So There's a lot of people who wanted populist ideas to um, bear fruit in our government. And at the state level, they were successful. 1,500 plus candidates were elected to state offices, okay? And then we see this in the election of 1896, okay? So we see blue, William Jennings Bryan, and we see the pinkish red, which was President McKinley, who won this. And if you look at this, hey, it almost looks like a Civil War map. The agricultural areas were on board with populist ideas. The more industrial areas we're not, okay? And if you want to go even deeper, check out today's politics for red and blue states. I think you need to uh, flip it here. But anyway, you, you get my point, okay? And number five, we see organized labor emerging, okay? Labor helped build this industrial society. The nature of work changed a lot in the 19th and 20th centuries. Industrial and factory jobs forced individuals to adapt to new labor systems. So conflicts emerge between bosses and management, or bourgeoisie, and the worker, the proletariat. When enough workers felt oppressed and mistreated, they banded together in an attempt to improve their situations. Okay, and this happened throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Okay, as I speak to you now in Michigan, um, we are a right-to-work state. Unions are not as strong as they used to be, and that seems to be the trend. Okay, that's for another day. And here's an example of one of these labor, labor organizations, the Knights of Labor, 1869. Initially, it was secret, then it went public about 10 years later, and we had uh, leadership under a guy named Terrence Powderly, and with his leadership, the Knights flourished, recruited a lot of members. And they were very egalitarian, especially for the time. All workers were welcome, skilled, unskilled, women, black people, which was very, very egalitarian at the time. And the American uh, Federation of Labor was a counter to this. Okay, These were workers that were only male, white, and skilled. 
uh, founded by Samuel Gompers, and they used boycotts and strikes as tools for a change. Um, they eventually merged with the CIO to form the AFL-CIO, long-lasting organization, hit its peak in the 70s with over 20 million members. Okay, so another labor organization, certainly not as egalitarian as the Knights of Labor. Okay, and then we see conflicts getting really, really ugly. Now, Haymarket, very famous place. Um, I was recently in Chicago on Haymarket, and they had some commemorations of that event. But the workers at the McCormick Harvester Plant wanted an eight-hour workday, and police ordered the workers to disperse. A dynamite bomb was thrown at the police, killed eight police officers. Police officers fire, fired back, killed eight protesters, wounded over 100. And this was the name given to the strike rally and bombing that took place, as well as the executions of the leaders, okay? Now, socialists and anarchists were blamed, okay? And it further divided the nation's sentiments regarding organized labor. Number nine, homestead strike. And you see, you're going to start seeing a pattern here if you haven't already. Homestead strike um, or the massacre or battle of homestead. It was an industrial lockout and strike which began in 1892 and culminated in a battle between strikers and private security pivotal event in U.S. labor history. Now, this was run by Andrew Carnegie, who was in Scotland at the time, and he put his main man, Andrew Fick, Frick, excuse me, in charge while Carnegie was in Scotland. Well, Frick closed the plant, broke the union, hired these thugs called Pinkerton detectives, big, burly, violent guys to provide the muscle. Now, in this case, management won, and the union was not reinstated. So people who were Siding with Carnegie chalked it up to a victory, but workers throughout America really saw that as a defeat and more motivation to galvanize as workers. Uh, Coxey's Army is another example. 1893 was a really rough year for America, really bad economic depression, lots of jobless poor people. And one guy, Jacob Coxey, he was a wealthy quarry owner, but he turned populist. He had a heart for the workers, and he led a movement from... Uh, to go to Washington, D.C., along with his family and 400 protesters, and along the way, uh, supporters would feed them and house them, and eventually he got arrested for walking on the grass. We see example after example of workers rising up. Workers strike in protest. Um, we see the American Railway Union. That shut down 20 railroads. The Pullman strike, okay, shaped national labor policy in the United States during a period of deep economic depression. So President Cleveland, the president had to come to, to break it up, had to send federal troops to break it up. So this is how contentious it was. We're seeing it in farming. We're seeing it in just about every facet of our economy during this time. But bear in mind, railways, if you shut those down, that can really cripple the country. OK, um, for those of you who went through COVID-19 when we were having difficulty getting uh, items to market, you, you experience that a little bit of um, how vital transportation is to keep things going. The miners got involved, okay? In the 1880s, 1890s, uh, there were unions that formed in the coal miners of Pennsylvania, Ohio, Virginia, West Virginia. Now, the miners were not about the violence against owners, but victories for the workers. And the United Mine Workers of America was founded in 1890. Add this to the list. Maybe the most dangerous job in America is being a miner. And they said, hey, you better compensate us for our risk, that sort of thing. And then we see the industrial workers of the world, nicknamed the Wobblies. And the Wobblies was an organization, 1905, again, 19th century, 20th century. And they wanted to bring all of the workers into one big union, which would make management and the wealthy pretty nervous. Now, opponents deem their intentions as anti-capitalist, socialist, or even the more extreme form of socialism, communism. So we have this fundamental divide here, okay, between the workers and those who profit off of the workers. Uh, another example, the garment industry, and this is a horrible story. Uh, New York City alone had 40,000 people who worked in the garment trades. Most of these workers were young women. Now, this particular fire was because they didn't have adequate exits and they chained exit doors to prevent workers from sneaking off to have their cigarette breaks. And it showed how dangerous American factories were. And 146 people died, burned to death, you know, asphyxiated, jumped out the window, real ugly scene. But ultimately it led to new rules for safety at workplaces. Case in point, think of how many exits and fire drills we have at school every year okay you you get that you can connect that to the uh, triangle shirtwaist disaster 
uh, Bread and Roses, the Lawrence Strike of 1912. This was a spontaneous strike in the mills of Lawrence, Massachusetts. During the strike, women just walked through the streets with signs saying, we want bread and roses. That's the nickname of this. And this method was effective in getting the attention for management. So you name a facet of the American economy, workers were banding together in solidarity to demand better working conditions, safety, eight-hour work days, the whole nine, right? And here's the last one, Ludlow, Colorado. Uh, this is a 14-month strike, and the management was so tired of it, they recruited the militia to come in. They uh, took positions around the miners' camp and opened fire. Over 30 people were killed, including several women and ch children. So you see these conflicts between management and workers were really pronounced and pretty ugly, okay? And that was the nature of the beast at the time. Okay, so to wrap up, the assessment for the day. Please answer this in AP style, if you know what I'm talking about. And here it is. How did some of the disenfranchised, these were workers, blacks, farmers, etc., attempt to make their voices heard in the late 1800s and early 1900s? Why were their tactics different? How successful were various groups okay so it's a heavy day it's an intense day i know i went through this video pretty quick and again didn't work for you check out the powerpoint check out your book and uh i can tell you tomorrow's class is much easier but today there was a lot i think i gave you a drink with a fire hose not a, not a garden hose but sometimes that's the way it goes in ap right okay thank you for watching